afternoon and welcome to Have We Got Planning News For You. Thank you all very much for joining us once again. Welcome to our YouTube viewers. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get all our updates at the earliest opportunity. Now, on the subject of social media, we have literally just heard about one minute ago that somebody has been very kind enough to shortlist us for the Legal Cheek Awards of 2021 for best use of social media, which is rather exciting to say the least. Um, so uh, watch this space. Um, can I give you uh, our usual reminder to consider making a charity donation in lieu of registration fee? You know by now uh, the charities we support are NHS combined charities Just Giving page and Shelter, but of course feel free as always to donate to a charity of your choice if you prefer. Um, now we're really delighted um, to welcome as our special guest this week Dr Wei Yang the recently inaugurated uh, president of the RTPI for 2021, founder of the award-winning Wei Yang and Partners, finalist of the Wilson Prize 2014, a board member of the British Library, trustee of the Landscape Institute. If there's anything to be done in our industry, Wei's done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Wei, for, for joining us um, and welcome. Can you tell us where you're calling from, what you've chosen as your theme uh, for our episode and uh, what you're drinking this evening? Thank you, Charles. Hi. Um uh, I'm calling from my home, um, located in South Berkshire, and also I think it's very close to Maidenhead, so let's put it this way, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. So since I'm the first Chinese uh, joining your show, so I have to choose the theme to be China. I was a bit confused whether our theme was tree or China. I think eventually we decide to be China. So related to China, my drink is actually, uh, this is a Chinese spirit used wow. in Chinese national banquet, and the name is called Mao Tai. And uh, I have a very good story because actually it was given by a client uh, to me. But uh, <clears throat> the story I want to tell is um, in 18, uh, sorry, in 1915, uh, this drink went to uh, the World Expo uh, in San Francisco, San Francisco. And then eventually didn't get any attention because the design of the, the, the bottle was quite old fashioned. <laughs> and then somebody decided to break the bottle. And then when everybody smelled the spirit, they loved it. And then the, the spirit won the gold medal in that ah, oh, fantastic. <laughs> so I think it's very related to my theme really want to bring the spirit of everybody out of the planning ah, profession as well very good <laughs> very poetic fantastic well we're really looking forward to our discussion with you which Paul is going to lead uh, in the second half of our show as always um, and uh, I'll repeat the invitation that I give to all our guests no obligation to comment on anything we're discussing in the first half of the show but equally if you have any opinions on anything we say please do um, chip in um, now, it's, it's time to introduce the panel, and as always, uh, Mary in the gallery, and what good, have you got there? Good, good afternoon, good afternoon. Mary Cook, Town Legal, uh, from the woods in Wandsworth, and here is my Chinese theme. This was bought by my darling son on a school trip to China. What a lucky boy he was. He had a great time, and he brought back this screen, which hangs downstairs, so... Um, Here's my, my, my Chinese theme, and I am drinking naturally China tea out of a little Miss Giggles <laughs> teacup. Fantastic, Mary. Great, great to see you. Paul, how are you getting on? Uh, very well, thank you, Charlie. Well, for um, my China theme, <coughs> I, I did go for this, which I'm going to mispronounce. <laughs> Sing Zhao? Sing Tao? Yeah. Um, which, uh, it is a beer that I got from the takeaway. I'm very lucky to live just down the road from Gordon Ramsay's best Chinese restaurant in the country. Uh, wow. called You and You, which is now known just as You. I think there's maybe a fallout with Victor You, I might be wrong. Um, but when I look at the back of it, um, uh, it turns out it's actually imported from Dublin. So <laughs> I've decided, in those circumstances, I'm having a Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Chris, you appear to be being filmed by drone this week. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on mute. Never have you sounded sweeter. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, lots of complaints about the quality of my camera. So Rob has fitted me up with a proper decent camera. Um, this has happened before, hasn't it? Goes <laughs> <laughs> a drink from Dublin, <laughs> which is lovely. Uh, my daughter has asked me to say to you, uh, Wei, Ni Hu Shen Ma. <laughs> I think it must be your yeah. translation. Uh, we will have to try time. again. That's not gone so well. He who shen ma. Well, apparently, that, well, that's what she told me it means. What do you like to drink? But perhaps not. Um, and presumption is in a cast landscape. Uh, you can mm. see him there. Uh, it's his Chinese thing. 
And I just want to emphasize one thing. A lot of complaints last week uh, about uh, the rabbits, me mentioning the rabbits. So I am joined by the rabbits. They're going to come out a bit later to show that they were not harmed by a fox last week. <laughs> Superb, Chris. Great to see you. And Sash, last but not least, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in London <coughs> and my in. I am having some jasmine tea. Hmm which is absolutely delicious and the favourite thing that I enjoy when I go to Chinese restaurants is to have lovely jasmine tea. And um, yeah, I'm very well and really looking forward to England winning 4-0 in India starting tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic, that's great to see you. Well, Charlie Banner here. Um, I've never been to mainland China, but I've spent some of the best months of my life in, in Hong Kong in 2008 when I did a what lawyers call a Pegasus scholarship over there for three months working in a planning uh, law firm in, in Hong Kong and for Mr Justice Litton. Um, of, of the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. Um, yes, in relation. And um, anyway, so I'm wearing my Hong Kong Yacht Club um, polo shirt, which I still just about fit into. Uh, one of the best days no, of my life. No, you don't. No, you don't. I was about to say something very rude then. <laughs> we must have our first uh, uh, bleeping. But um, yeah, no, one of the best days of my life. I rode around Hong Kong. Um, rode as in on a boat, not on a horse. Um, and uh, with, with some various colleagues from the Hong Kong Rowing Club, and uh, we won the whole race. And there's some silverware in the Hong Kong Yacht Club in uh, Middle Island um, with, with my name on it, apparently. Um, and also in tribute to Hong Kong, I told you where I was going to get some, have some tea, but after the week I've had, I thought I needed something stronger like that. And so on Deliveroo, I was able to get up um, Hakkasan, a very, well, very good Chinese restaurant in, uh, in London, and get one of their cocktails. Now, I must say, I didn't quite appreciate it was going to be serves four or five. It's on their Midnight in Hong Kong collection. So um, it's rather strong. It's a popcorn old fashioned. And I've even got little bits of popcorn about it to put in it. Um, it, it, it it's, uh, so we shall see, but I certainly won't drink the whole lot of it. Otherwise I'll be uh, dancing my way home tonight. <laughs> anyway, um, on to the serious stuff. And our, our first um, case is uh, one that you're going to cover, Chris, and um, you're actually going to, for I think for the third time um, this season already, we've had a judgment come out either on the day or the day before uh, on paragraph 11 of the framework. So we're going to break that, uh, are we not, uh, Chris? We are. We are indeed. Uh, and um, the case uh, is Gladman, Developments, uh, Secretary of State, Corby Borough Council and Ucklesborough District Council. Now, this only came out yesterday, and uh, as you can see, uh, Richard Kimblin and Thea Osmond-Smith were for Gladman in the case, and Richard Honey was defending for Secretary of State. This is a case in the Court of Appeal, already dismissed by Mr Justice Holgate in the High Court, and um, the matter went higher up. Now, at its heart, this case is a question of policy interpretation. Uh, such questions have become familiar work for the court. Uh, the the, uh, the um, people in Blom observed, um, and we saw that last week as well. It's quite clear the court is not enjoying all this interpretation as a consequence of Tesco and Dundee. No. Two decisions under challenge. One was a challenge to a decision dismissing an appeal against the decision of Corby District Council, a borough council for uh, 125 houses. Um, at Gretton, and the other was another appeal dismissed um, against Uttlesford District Council for 240 dwellings uh, on land at Station Road, Flitch Green. Now, I happen to know that what's behind these challenges is actually a concern that inspectors are not properly applying the presumption. Gladman have got, I think, increasingly concerned, as have others, that lots of appeals are succeeding in demonstrating a lack of five-year land supply, but they're then not succeeding in terms of actually being granted planning permission. Now, in both of these cases, the, uh, the so-called uh, tilted balance was applied under 11D2. Um, and in both cases, that was because the local authorities couldn't demonstrate uh, a five-year supply. And the issues in the case that the court identified were these. First of all, whether a decision maker, when applying the tilted balance under 11D2, and we all know what that is, the adverse impacts test, is required not to take into account relevant policies of the development plan. So to leave those to one side. And the second, uh, a connected issue, is whether it's necessary for the tilted balance and the duty under Section 38.6 of the 2004 Act to be performed as a separate and sequential step in a two-stage process. And there was a third question surrounding 
um, paragraph 213. Now, this is essential reading. Um, if we just uh, remind ourselves about paragraph 11, in terms of decision making, at least, what that says is um, that um, one can apply um, where there's no relevant development plan policies, all the policies which are most important for determining application are out of date, granting planning permission, unless the application of policies in the framework that protect areas suggests that it should be refused. And with that comes footnote six. And that's the important part in this case, because footnote six uh, is the footnote that um, then goes on to refer to the policies referred to in this framework and list them. What we know is the closed list, but it's that reference to footnote six in uh, 11C1 that is the relevant part. And then part two is the test we all know is the tilted balance. Any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. That's when you wouldn't grant planning permission in those situations. Um, now, um, as far as that second issue is concerned, I'll just deal with that quickly. Um, what the, the court said, in my view, there's nothing to prevent an approach in which the application of the tilted balance under 11D uh, is incorporated into the decision making under Section 70 in one all encompassing stage. The decision maker is not obliged to combine in a single exercise paragraph 11D2's assessment with the uh, assessment required to be discharged under. Uh, 38.6. Um, in principle, uh, however, he may uh, he may lawfully. Uh, if the, if this is done, the decision maker must keep in mind the statutory primacy of the development plan and the statutory requirement to have regard to other material considerations, including the policies of the MPPF and specifically the policies of the tilt balance uh, under paragraph 11D2 and must make the decision as section 38.6 requires in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise it will not be necessary to consider twice in separate steps matters that arise under both the relevant policies of the development plan and policies under the MPPF. The realistic approach in such a case is likely to be to take into account the development plan policies at 11D2, the tilted balance, assessing within the assessment rather than outside it. And, uh, and Mr. Justice Holgate dismissed the idea of double counting if you have to do it twice. Now that's the second issue. That's saying you don't ignore the development plan and perform it as some kind of separate sequential test. The main issue though in the case, if, we could, if I just focus on that, um, in both those cases, it, what happened was that uh, the appeal was dismissed just to give you a, a taste of, of that issue, in the Gretton case, that's the Corby case, um, the inspector identified two issues. He found um, harm to the locality and accessibility of the area, and he found a shortfall in the five-year land supply of 4 .6 to, between 4.6 and 4.8 years. And his overall conclusion was, whilst there is a need to boost the supply of housing, that's not the be all and end all, the inspector said. There are clearly a number of benefits, but they don't, out, uh, they don't outweigh the adverse impact. The judgment of Mr. Justice Holgate in the High Court was to say that the MPPF does not exclude development plan policies from the tilted balance. They are relevant considerations. And I, and I must say, I think most of us would approach it on that basis. Generally, the adverse impacts are defined by the reasons for refusal, which defined generally based on development plan policies. So one would rather assume that the adverse impacts were the development plan policy breaches. Um, and uh, Mr. Justice Holgate had said in the High Court, the issue essentially involves the same arguments as previously been rejected in the courts in Hopkins Homes, Hallam Land, uh, Crane and Woodcock. So this judgment brings together a lot of the case law um, surrounding the application of the presumption. And in coming to that conclusion, Holgate observed that when the policy in paragraph 11D2 is triggered, the tilted balance is triggered, because a five year supply cannot be demonstrated, the decision maker will still need to assess the weight to be given to development plan policies, including whether or not they are in substance out of date, and if so, for what reasons. In these circumstances, the MPPF doesn't prescribe the weight. Uh, and um, against that, something that often comes up 
uh, Mr. Justice Holgate had emphasized that it's important for the decision maker to take account of the, the extent and the nature of the housing shortfall. And here in this case, the Gretton case, because it was only 4.6 years, 4.8 years supply, only short by 0 0.2, 0 0.4 years, there wasn't a need to significantly um, uh, reduce the weight. So the, the shortfall is important. A lot of inspectors don't always appreciate that. And it is important to understand it. And then finally, must development plan policies be left out of account? This is the main issue, this argument that you put them to one side. I haven't got time to go through it now, but I would recommend entirely to everybody paragraphs 32 and 33, where um, in the Court of Appeal, uh, Sir Keith Limblom is emphasising the approach to be taking. And crucial to this is emphasising the primacy of the development plan, albeit the MPPF introduces the tilted balance, we mustn't get away from remembering that the development plan is the fundamental basis of it all. Uh, paragraph uh, 34 as well, further guidance from the court, absolutely essential. And the argument in the case, I'll just be another a minute, this is quite a lot to get through, but the, the key argument, Richard, Richard Kimblin from, from number five, um, made the argument that the inspectors in both of these cases had made a mistake when conducting the exercise by taking into account policies in the development plan and proposal and conflict with the development plan on a straightforward interpretation he said without reading any additional words into it the meaning of the policy is clear when you apply the tilted balance you do so on the basis of the policies in the framework local plan policies don't come into that and at paragraph 42 this is the, the, the nub of it Lord Justice Lindblom says, I can't accept that argument. As Mr. Honey submitted for the Secretary of State, it's implicit in previous decisions to this court. The decision makers are not legally bound to disregard policies in the development plan when applying the tilted balance under 11D2. The, the Supreme Court in Hopkins Homes accepted in principle the appropriateness of assessing the weight the development plan policies should have in the tilted balance itself within the overall performance of section 38.6, that duty, which is obviously statutory duty in respect of the development plan. And therefore, the, the appeals were dismissed. And um, this is making very clear that decision makers need to take account of development plan policies as part of the adverse impacts when you apply the tilted balance. Thanks, Chris. I mean, it is worth pausing on this case because I mean, what's really significant is in the space of a month, we've had three cases on paragraph 11. We've had uh, Paul Newman Holmes basically denuding the no relevant policies gateway to the tilted balance of any real effect. You've had Monk Hill, which uh, considerably expands the concept of clear reasons for refusal. I would say that, wouldn't I? And now you've got uh, Gladman, which in a balance which is meant to be weighed against the development plan, development plan again, which you might think is double counting. Um, incremental, those three decisions incrementally together um, seem to me to, to deprive the framework of a lot of the effect of what it's about, which is to get um, get more development built when you've got a development plan that isn't doing its job. Wouldn't it be great if those three cases all proceeded to the Supreme Court in a conjoined appeal with perhaps an intervention from... Um, stop it, stop it, let's honestly, move on. Charlie, um, just one of the big stop it. Uh, developer um, fora. Uh, just an idea. Um, and I'm not an ambulance chaser. Now, Sasha, you've got a case which on the script, I confess I haven't read this case. It's, it's RV United Trade Action Group. Is this some kind of workers' strike case that you're going to entertain us with? Or has it got I'm not, but I'm just going to make I'm going to make a point. I actually think the court got that case right, Gladman case right. And of course, the million dollar point is that the MPPF never did and never has properly grappled with the relationship of Section 38.6 and the tilt of balance. That is why we have so much bloody litigation about it. So that, that's my comment. Um, but in relation, yeah, I'm going to become a London taxi driver, which you can all envisage very easily for the purposes of this. <laughs> uh, and I actually, you know what? My first ever brief was it was defending a, a, the London Taxi Drivers Association. My first ever inquiry against Natalie Lieben. And she came into the room. I was obviously shaking like a leaf. And she said to me, first comment she ever made to me was, you clearly haven't got a clue what the law is. Um, <laughs> It's a rather sobering moment in my professional career, I must say, when someone... You always Natalie was very wise. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to talk about this case because it relates to a very topical subject, which I'm sure all our audience deal with. And that is when you're subject 
a local authority is subject to a decision making process and someone alleges it's unlawful and this is this case and as you'll notice um, this was recently determined on the 20th of Jan. Now this this case is not strictly about planning but it's about temporary traffic orders being made by Transport for London and, the, and effectively the, the, the taxi drivers took the view that Transport for London and those of us who've got to navigate through London notwithstanding the lockdown basically TfL have gone trigger happy and I don't think there's a road in central London which hasn't been fiddled with in some way and all of those lawyers who use Chancery Lane now beware you cannot drive up Chancery Lane as I've done three times between seven and seven otherwise you get a camera. Anyway this case was about Bishopsgate and the taxi drivers weren't allowed to go down Bishopsgate and they basically felt that the decision-making process of Transport for London had not taken into account the effect on taxis which is understandable but what happened in the course of litigation was a huge amount of witness statements very extensive witness statements particularly from transport for london saying what they had taken into account in making the decision and this case revolves around which we all face is to what extent can you put witness statements in dealing with what actually happened at the time you made the decision effectively um post facto justification for the decision and what is this is very seminal obviously for judicial review dealing with planning committees and what members had in their minds when they made decisions and the general position which is worth reiterating is the court said very strongly that it, there's a strict approach of admissibility to after the event evidence so for all of us who are involved in defending and bringing judicial reviews and it's also true relevant for 288s and what was in the inspector's minds because as most of you all know, there's a seminal case where Duncan Oosley talked about inspectors not putting in witness statements saying, although it's not in the decision letter, I did take this into account. Um, so the simple point is don't try and justify decisions after the event with lots of evidence because it won't wash with the courts. Thank you, Charlie. You obviously haven't looked at that Duncan Oosley decision to see who is the barrister acting that case who tried to get that inspector's decision supplemented it with the statement and got a wrap across the knuckles by oh. <laughs> um sorry anyway. i walked into an advertising uh, webcast about charlie bannock you see <laughs> <laughs> i was talking myself down now uh, mary you've got a case in paul's neck of the woods haven't you to space? yes i'm gonna take you away to trafford uh to an appeal which took up 15 days of christina downs's time she was the inspector uh, it was the Battle of the Davids, David Manley versus David Forsdick, and Gillian Garvey played a, a starring role for the Rule 6 party, the Parish Council. And this was about a, a development by Red Row for up to 400 homes. And the housing requirement in the Trafford local plan uh, is out of date in the sense that the core strategy is a 2012 document. So we're now into standard methodology territory. And that resulted in a considerable increase in the requirement, which meant that Trafford only had a 2.4 year housing land supply and Red Row were plainly trying to capitalize on that. And everyone therefore accepted 11D was engaged. And really the issue was, was it 11D1 or was it 11D2? And I should just say at the outset that Christina Downs's decision is entirely lawful and entirely in tune uh, and consistent with what uh, Sir Keith Lindblom had to say in the case that, um, in the Gladman case, Chris has just covered. The, uh, um, the land in question was protected open land and there was a core strategy policy, L1, uh, preventing the uh, release of greenfield land unless it was to accommodate shortfalls so you might think that was quite a good start but providing the development was capable of creating sustainable commu uh, sustainable community now rob can you please show us the uh, parameter plan just to, to give a bit of context so this is a 25 hectare greenfield site immediately outside the uh, green belt and separated from Partington, so you can see the southern edge of Partington there, by a brook called the Red Brook. And the inspector found that the Red Brook was a clear physical and perceptual barrier, and that, that, that between the proposed Red Rose scheme to the south and Partington uh, was the floodplain, and the development offered no crossing points, she noted. And on, there were 10 reasons for refusal. 
Um, so there were lots of issues and I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover them all um, in, in a sensible way. But on the question of unacceptable harm, because one of the arguments here was about the adequacy of this plan, which was the parameter plan. And the inspector said it was adequate. But what she said was um, it didn't demonstrate that with an appropriate design, up to 400 homes could be achieved within the parameters without significant harm to the landscape character and visual amenity of the area. And she was particularly interested in the lane which runs on the, the southern side of the eastern part of this uh, d development, because she said that the proposals would have a, a contrary, um, an adverse impact on the character of that lane. Um, th thank you, Rob. So there were four grade, uh, grade two listed buildings. There were some um, undesignated heritage assets. All of those had minor or negligible um, harmful impacts. There was a really interesting archeological issue um, and plainly all parties, including the parish council called evidence. And the Trafford and the parish council argued that footnote 63 is engaged. In other words, they said, the archeological interest was demonstrably equivalent to a scheduled mon monument. And so they wanted trial trenching undertaken before any planning permission was granted. The inspector, and this is what I think is interesting about this point, the inspector applied a precautionary approach and she approached it on, on the basis of a balance of probability. And she said she wasn't satisfied that the uh, archeological interest was uh, indeed of national interest. She said it was likely to be local and at most regional. So the appellant won on that issue. He, the appellant also satisfied her on highway congestion and safety issues, but Redro offered up no affordable housing. The policy required 40%, they offered up none, and that was on the basis of viability. There were three days worth of viability evidence nothing was agreed. There was no viability statement of common ground. Indeed, Trafford made an unsuccessful attempt at a, a costs application on the back of uh, vi the viability evidence. And it seems as if each side accused each other's witnesses of behaving in an unprofessional way. She had none of that. She said uh, all the attacks on credibility and integrity were uh, unfounded. But nevertheless, she, uh, at the end of the day, she preferred the council's uh, viability evidence. Uh, in particular, there was a big issue about the plus. So benchmark land value, EUV plus. Councils uh, uh, wanted a 10, a 10 times agricultural value uplift. Appellants started off uh, with 20 uh, and then went down to 15 and Christina Downs settled on 10. Uh, and there were various other issues, but as I say, uh, the appellants lost on the viabil viability issue and she wasn't impressed by the unilateral undertaking, which offered a commitment to a revised financial viability assessment at the stage when the reserve matters uh, went in, but without committing to taking into account the reserve matters application. She wasn't impressed with that. Um, so overall, where did she land? She landed uh, on the basis that the 2.4 year supply was a very serious uh, shortfall. She gave uh, substantial weight to the delivery of 150 houses uh, in the five year period. She gave moderate weight to the economic advantages. She gave limited weight to the policy plus in green infrastructure uh, and the other benefits. She found that the limited weight to the heritage interests was not enough to restrict the operation of the tilted balance. So therefore she moved on to D paragraph two territory. And it was a case of giving very significant weight to the conflict with the strategic policy in the plan, just to come back to this point about using development plan policies uh, and very substantial weight to the failure to provide affordable housing. Substantial benefits were outweighed by very substantial harms and red row lost. Thanks, Mary. Um, well, from, from uh, Christina Downs, who's one of the inspectors I most enjoy appearing in front of, to another one, Paul Griffiths, um, a, a very um, fun and good humoured inspector. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about one of his decisions uh, from the 19th of January relating to an appeal by Bellway 
against the refusal by um, Dorset Council of reserve matters approval for um, all matters apart from access, pursuant to an outline permission uh, granted um, in 2016 um, for up to 350 dwellings. Uh, and the case and decision are notable, perhaps even remarkable for um, what I'd say are five reasons. Uh, first, the main issue was the effect on character and appearance, having regard to the site's location and the setting of two AO and Bs, but it proceeded by way of inquiry, which is quite unusual these days for a case where the main issue is, is of that nature. And it's clear from the decision um, that Paul Griffiths found the rigour of the inquiry process useful. Secondly, it was an allocated site in both the local plan and the neighbourhood plan, with outline permission granted over four years previously. What on earth was the local authority doing resisting it, you might wonder? Um, well, thirdly, I hear you say, well, there must have been something unacceptable about the detail. Well, no, said Inspector Griffiths, having examined the landscape and character issue in impressive but characteristic detail in his decision. He said that the impacts were, and I'm quoting him, nothing beyond what would have been inevitable when the site was deemed suitable for housing in the local plan and neighbourhood plan and granted outline permission for up to 350 dwellings. Fourthly, the local authority's resistance of this was in the context of its admitted failure to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply. So not only was this an allocated site in two layers of the development plan and had outlined permission four years ago, they didn't have a five-year supply. Uh, and Inspector Griffiths was particularly scathing about this, noting that if the council's suggestion that the site couldn't accommodate the 315 dwellings that they had granted permission for, um, a surprising argument, um, if that argument was correct, the shortfall from that 350 would have to be met elsewhere on other greenfield sites in the setting of the AMB, um, which had been considered to be uh, more impactful in the local plan process. This was, he said, untenable, uh, his words, strong words for an inspector. Um, fifthly, and perhaps unsurprising in the light of all of that, Inspector Griffiths made a full award of costs against local authority, and in doing so, he rejected their attempt to hide behind the argument that impact on character and appearance was subjective, which is almost always a fairly strong defence against a cost claim in cases where that's the main issue. He held in his cost decision, again, I'm quoting him, I cannot see how the visual evidence produced by the council can remotely justify the conclusions that were drawn, that is unreasonable behaviour. Well, lesson learned, you hope. Four and a half years after the outline permission was granted, Bellway can finally start living homes in this site. Little wonder the planning white paper thought there was scope for streamlining the planning system. Paul, over to you. Uh, hello, Way. Uh, apologies that you've, uh, you've been sitting there patiently listening uh, to our descriptions. Uh, uh, the excitement of lawyers when they get hold of cases in an audience is always too much, and I'm as guilty as everybody else. Uh, you know uh, what I thought? I thought, I'm glad I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> 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 and, and for all those that have thought that uh, Chris does in fact live in the live the life of a James Bond villain, it's now been proven with the rabbit. Uh, so uh, welcome to Chris's rabbit. Um, so wait, you were inaugurated as the 107th president of the RTPI this year, uh, with I think Tim uh, Crawshaw as vice president. So you now head an organisation founded in, in 1914 as the world's first professional institute with 26,000 members in 80 countries. Huge burden on your shoulders and you're looking well on it, I'm happy to say. Um, now, you arrived from Beijing, I think, in 1999 to study for a master's degree in Sheffield, and you've remained, although your work still takes you back to China. And you've had a meteoric rise. I think you were only an associate member back in 2010, and you, were, you became a fellow in 2018. But you were only the 16th female fellow uh, of the RTPI in 107 years. I confess I found that figure shocking when I when I saw it. You're obviously an amazing role model, but based upon that or any other issue, how, how important will equality and diversity be during your first year of office? Yeah, I think that's very important. That's why I, I became president. As I showed earlier, I think we, we all have our spirit inside. We need to break it out to show people. It's the same for a person, also for a profession as well. I think joining the RTPI is not only to get a professional qualification for you to get a better career. It's more important, I think, we believe by joining the uh, Institute, the RTPI, we can act together for the public benefit for to, to show more impact of the profession. I think that's the importance of, of joining the Institute. Well, so, yeah. As I say, great, great role model, uh, Wei. You are an extraordinary polymath, polymath. Now, I know you've you've become, uh, one of your real interests has been the Garden City movement. And in fact, you've written, and I think in your inaugural address, you said that you were disappointed how little known the Garden City movement is in terms of the general public. 
Now, you've got a global perspective on the Garden City movement, which I think, in fairness, started in the UK. I even inspired by your inaugural address, I even bought the book by uh, Ebenezer Howard, which I've started reading, which is shameful four decades into my planning career. Um, so w why, why do you think that the, the Garden City movement is so little appreciated by the public, so far under the public radar? Yes, thank you for the question. I think it's a very good one. Uh, I think actually may be called, there are lots of misunderstandings about uh, what Garden City is really about. Actually, Ebenezer Howard himself regretted the name of Garden Cities because everybody had their own interpretation about what the Garden City is about. And very soon after the Garden City movement started, lots of developers started to use the name to name their housing estate as Garden uh, suburbs or garden uh, cities. So I think uh, Abanisa Howell, he deeply regretted he chose that name. He had a, a few was going to choose. I think one uh, one he really liked the most was uh, it's like a name, it's a combined, he created a name. It's more like um, uh, towns in rural settings. I think he really would like to use that name. And also another reason um, is uh, lots of people maybe like you Paul, sorry, they, they never read the book, even like Jane Jacobs. Lots of people, they never read the book, but they criticize the Garden City principles. I think the very famous one is the death and the life of the great American cities. And uh, I think from what I read from the book, she never really uh, read, read the Garden City theory at all. So I think what I think the most in, important part about the Garden City uh, theory is really about, uh, I believe how we talk about human nature is I think human nature will naturally kind of selfish. And then what he want to say, actually he want to bring a new civilization. So we become selflessness. So we get say supporting from, by, by supporting uh, from each other, actually we bring the best of human nature from our community. So I think that's all Garden City is about. That, that, that's great. I have to say, uh, I'm, I'm up to chapter five, which starts off with a quotation from the old curiosity shop which is magnificent, so recommend it to anybody. Um, now, in terms of your, your global perspective, obviously your, your work is in, in, international and has been international, uh, and I was very interested. In fact, to be honest, researching to interview is like, like a joyous rabbit warren, and I said that and wrote that before I knew that Chris was going to be a rabbit, so it's a <laughs> metaphorical rabbit warren. Um, but it's the insights you give to your international perspective that, that have really fascinated me. So last September you gave a presentation to the urban design group on the concept of the 15 minute city, which was initiated by the Shanghai Metropolitan Government in 2016 and is now being rolled out across China. So w what is it and why, why is it useful and valuable and what lessons can we learn from it? Yeah, that's a very good initiative. Um, in 2016, the Shanghai government, they finished their strategic plan for 2040. And then they identified that they are going to use 15 minutes neighborhood as the principle to, abide, to apply all the neighborhoods. And then as, apart from that, uh, they produced a, a, a design guidance to, to how to apply the 15 minutes neighborhood principle in, by all, all the planners. Apart from that, I think the most innovative part is they produced a guidance. It's not a guidance, like an introduction book for the general public. And it's being drawn as a, like a cartoon style. So it's very, very light touch. It's lots of um, uh, very interesting images. And then they choose a story of a family um, of three generations, six people in that family of three generations. They show actually how the grandparents live and then how the parents, how they go to work and how the kids go to school. So actually it's a very interesting story. So because China, China is facing an aging population as well. So that um, story shows say how grandparents, they can uh, go to uh, local uh, medical center or they can go to their uh, canteen, canteen or they can go to uh, there is this uh, elderly uh, exercise center and also colleges and libraries so all sorts of social infrastructure is arranged around all their 15 minutes neighborhood from five minutes to 15 minutes work i think by having that help to explain the principles of these 15 minutes garden uh, 15 minutes communities to the general public and also it's a quite a um say uh, quite a comprehensive community engagement um, say um, program to ask the local communities to contribute into different stages of implementing that strategy. So I think that's really innovative. 
Um, I, I, I wrote uh, a draft question, which I know I sent through to you, a, a very dull question about uh, reform and the white paper and lessons to be learned from that. And you properly pulled me up on it and said that a far more interesting question would be a reference to an interview that you'd, you'd had from a Cambridge professor who asked you what three words you associate most with planning. Now, that's one of the questions from the white paper. And lots of very worthy answers came through. I think I said undervalued and under-resourced and very important. So what are the three words that you would associate with planning in the UK? And I'm very interested to know what, is, what words you'd use for China. Mm, I think if I may just choose generally, I think all the planning profession around the world, we should use the same principle. Brilliant. So I think, yeah, the three word I would give, uh, actually I gave to the Cambridge professor was um, compassion selflessness and uh, creativity. Because I think compassion and the selflessness are the moral foundations of the planning profession. And the creativity is the character of the planning profession because I think planning profession is very innovative. I suspect you may be one of the few people to have added the word compassion, compassion in terms of that list. And yet how important really is it? And, and then my final question before handing over to, to my colleagues. Um, um, You've obviously got a wide range of international experience. I mean, your firm, I think one of the projects was a water garden in Berlin for, for Buddhism, which I think is fabulous. That's another rabbit hole I went down, by the way. Um, help me in general terms. Are there any good practice you can suggest that, that we can bring in from international, uh, international experience into the UK? Yeah, I think, for example, uh, I was thinking about your question because every country have their different contexts. I think actually we can learn quite a lot from Singapore because I think how they use the uh, public affordable housing strategy to implement a quite wider, a wider uh, housing strategy for the country is very um, usable. And, uh, and how say, they manage the private housing and the public housing in a quite uh, efficient way and, and maintain a very good quality of living environment. I think that's something we really can learn quite a lot from them. Uh, thank you very much, Wei. I'm going to just ask uh, Mary, I think you might have a question for, for Wei. Thank I you, do, I do. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I wanted to bring you uh, back to the MPPF and in particular to the government's draft consultation uh, for the new MPPF. And I wondered what, from an RTPI perspective, what you think about the emphasis now on well-designed development, but in particular, the call for tree-lined streets and for uh, appropriate measures for the maintenance of these tree-lined streets. It seemed to me that there was a call for arms for planners and highway authorities to really work together to create mm. tree-lined streets. Yes, I think certainly we welcome the government's emphasis on beauty, quality and design under the new Rules. I think certainly that's we welcome that. Uh, last year we did a survey to our with our member. Actually, um, eighty-eight percent of our member want have a greater power to reject poor quality design, but we feel we kind of lack of our capacity and resource to do so efficiently. So that's something emphasize on design quality is something we have been championing for years. And also on trees, I have a great passion with trees. My favorite tree is Scots pine. And I'm going to ask what are your, what are the, what are you, the favorite tree of yours later. And um, in terms of tree line street, and certainly I think I would welcome that. Um, but we, I think we should really think um, not only about say, we design trees or we specify trees. We also need to think about how these trees can be maintained and then how we can specify the right type of trees. And also I think from what I learned, a tree, in order for that tree to be carbon neutral, that tree needs to be 80 years old. So if a tree cannot survive for long enough, it just really, it's not really good for our environment. And also different trees, they have different carbon absorption uh, um, as well. So we we'll have to really think about what are the right tree to be specified as well. Yeah. So we have a lot, we can work together with the highway authorities. Well, well for, for those that uh, have, uh, know my literary bent, I'd have to say a Malon tree, but I'll come back to that later. Um, Char Charlie, um, somebody has indicated, I think Steve B has said, you've got to remember compassion when cross-examining. So that's perhaps one, one to take away. But I think you might have a question for Way. Yeah, Paul, I wanted to pick up what you were saying with international ang angle, actually, Wei. Um, uh, you, you know, as Paul said, your professional experience is... I don't want to say remarkably international poor planner because that sounds disparaging, but you, given that planning is tends to be focused on individual countries, 
and their systems. You say you stand out as somebody who has got that broader experience. Um, and I just wondered um, really two things. One, I say building on what Paul asked, it, other than the UK, which obviously, um, you know, as the president of RTPI, we do it best, but which country or countries do you think does planning the best? And what's the number one lesson we can learn from them? I think it's a public service um, function of planning. That's something we should really emphasize more. And also the, uh, the long-term thinking of planning. We have to really think beyond, say, professional boundaries and also beyond the present day. I think five years, maybe not enough. We, we need at least think about 20, 30 years. I think it's a long-term vision. I think it's something we should really emphasize more. That's a fascinating answer. There's an obvious tension there, isn't there, between the political element of planning, which is on five year electoral, four or five year electoral cycles and the longer term public interest. Yeah, because the strength of planning is about long term thinking. That's mm -hmm. what, that what we are good at. So we really have to bring that out. And also, I think a lot of people confuse with what is a planning profession and what is planning system. They do not equal to each other. I think the, 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 the vision or the scope of the planning profession is much broader than the planning system. Under Thank the planning you. system, uh, under the planning profession was not invented by the government anyway. Mm. It's, it's in interesting. My, one of my very first planning cases was in Liverpool. And I was taken around Liverpool by Steve Culkin, the then city solicitor, showed me the bomb site and said, planning is all about legacy. It's not about re-election. It's about the legacy that you create. Um, mm. Chris, I, I think you have a question for Wei? I do. But can I just first of all say I completely agree with you about the long term vision. It is so disappointing that new settlements which are backed by local authorities are failing in the planning system, which suggests the planning system is wrong rather than the idea of having new settlements. Um, and I think that that's what we need to get back to a longer term view completely. My question, though, uh, all presidents have a theme. What's your theme for your presidency? My theme is a revival of spirit for a modernized planning profession. So full actions. Actually, I wrote a manifesto <laughs> for my election. So number one is to, uh, to enhance public appreciation, appreciation of the planning profession. Because I think the public, as I, we said earlier, they know so little about the planning profession. And then secondly, it's about uh, enhance public, uh, uh, strengthen international collaboration on capacity building. Because we all live in one globe, we have to work with each other to tackle all these uh, climate and uh, environmental challenges. And then the third one is, uh, yeah, we have to take immediate actions on climate and the biodiversity uh, emergency actions. And also the, the fourth one, I think is a very important one. We have to engage with young planners and uh, empower the planning profession with modern technology. For example, like big data or digital um, revolution even. Excellent. 100% agree. Uh, uh, so finally, Sasha, your question, I think you were looking to take one from the audience or has the, the mood taken you and you're inspired to ask a, a different question? Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to ask, what, what would you say? We've obviously got many members. What are you going to say to the members of the RTPI who are listening We about your year? What are you hoping to achieve with them? I think my what I want to achieve because one year is very short. Um, for a, a presidential uh, year. But what I want is really, uh, I want to, like I said earlier, I want to make everybody feel proud of being a planner and also make the public more aware of what planning profession is about. And also I hope I can help to lay a foundation for the future of the planning profession. Uh, Wei, I think you wanted to ask the panel what their favorite yes, trip was. Yes, please. It, the final one. I've already told you that. Eventually I'm, it's I'm, my turn now. Yeah. I have some very good news I want to share with you. I think I have to do that. Yes, about our very important trade survey. That's my job, first job as the president. I send uh, an email to all our members and ask them what's their opinion about trees and how important is, it is uh, for tree in, in, in their day-to-day -day job. So how about I ask, what is your favorite tree? And then I will tell you how many of our members think. Um, we do it in the usual order, important. so Mary first, do the order we do it. Yeah, intro. Mary, please. I'm yeah. going to choose the oak tree. In my garden is a tree that uh, we planted, uh, started off life literally um, uh, from Wandsworth Common. Uh, when my first child was toddling around, we picked up a seed, we planted it in a pot, we watched it grow, and eventually we stuck it in, a, in the garden of now our second home. We've been here oh. 20 years. This tree is now 30 years old. That's my favorite tree. Send us a photo, Mary. I'd love to see how, how big it's grown. How wonderful. 
I'll, I'll give you a serious answer now rather than rather than something from Tolkien. My, my favourite tree, I have to say, is a sessile oak, uh, which has these magnificent horizontal branches. Uh, and that's partly because that one of my first cases was involving creation of an access in, uh, about the root structure of a sessile oak. And the day before the inquiry, uh, the, the tree officer and my arboriculturalist dug into the, the bank that we needed to, cut off the relevant uh, bit of root with the authority of the tree officer and brought it to the inquiry and says the inspector don't worry it's sorted the inspector went absolutely <laughs> <blistic>. <laughs> uh, so next on the list chris uh well for me it would have to be an australian eucalyptus tree i spent uh, a year when i was 18 in australia working for the national parks authority and part of that was planting lots and lots of trees including getting school kids to plant trees half of the trees went in the wrong way round no water uh, but uh, greening australia had a massive program to plant a billion trees and um and i've been back to australia and seen some of those trees since i love the eucalyptus trees fantastic sasha um i've got two candidates the first which i hope you'll be able to see can you see that ah uh, yes yeah yeah, yeah. That, that is a lime tree and that sums up the eccentricities of the British nation that's a lime tree which was in the outfield of Kent County Cricket Club so first class cricket was played and it was notwithstanding one of the big problems of being a fielder was crashing into that when you were trying to stop the ball and my other favourite tree and sorry to be a bit serious is the tree I gave my mother with my siblings a woodland burial last year and I think they are the most wonderful places, woodland cemeteries, because of their atmosphere they create. Mm. And I hope my mother likes it. She'll tell mm. me one day. <laughs> I'm sure she does. <laughs> Lo lovely answer, Sasha. Thank you. W way, how does that measure up for the, your survey? Yes. Uh, uh, yet, oh, I'm sorry, John. Yes. I'm sorry, Paul. Actually, Rob's got a photograph of it, um, or a picture of it. He's going to upload, I think, in a moment. Um, it's actually the oak. It's it's that this that is a. I was going to say a cherry tree or magnolia, but it's the more observant of you know. Um, I'm a big fan of David Hockney's art. One thing that I really learned from from watching a program here as interviewers, how art teaches you how to look look in a way that because you get to capture the moment. And actually, though I love the flowers of a magnolia or a cherry, the thing about a an oak in winter is is you look at the the it looks like fingers, little little branches. And when I was driving, can I say East Riding of Yorkshire? Uh, when I was driving around there with Stephen doing a site visit not that long ago in winter, seeing those, you could just see those kind of finger like branches of the oak. So um, I find that quite interesting, fascinating. So for, um, for me, you can always say the East Riding of Yorkshire, Charlie, and apologies for forgetting you there. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> So Wait, how, does that, how, do, how does that compare to uh, to your survey? Yeah, we have an excellent survey result. A uh, lot of our members responded, so it means they are very passionate about trees. So 96% of our members who responded think planning for and protect trees is a very important part of their job. So a lot of people think planning is only about built up environment. Actually, I think natural environment is very part of our job too, to look after. So if we don't, who will? So I think that's... Um, Nature is a very integral part of our society. Wait, wait um, th thank you, and I wish you the very best luck in terms of uh, your, your year in office. I'm sure it will be inspiring. And I'll hand back to you. Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Paul. Thank wait, you. Thank, thank you for me, Tim. And you are a true Renaissance woman, if I may say so, and you know, really thoughtful and thought provoking. Um, thank so, you. so thank you. Um, good luck. Um, Champion of the Week is going to be uh, my shout. And, and I'm going to name five consultancies. And they are Atkins in the following order Emery Planning, CBRE Planning. I see me projects, my great friends, and first plan. The reason I mention them is they are the five consultancies who, according to this week's planning magazine, um, have a proportion of planners who are female of 50% or more. Now, five is not a particularly great number, um, and I hope next year there'll be more, but credit for each of those firms for leading the way in that order. Um, nudge of the week is going to be Chris. It is, and I'm afraid I am going to have to nudge the inspectorate because um, what's happening at the moment is... Um, start date letters are being delayed and in the case of hearings a lot of hearings are just sitting in the ether they, they haven't got a date um you're being told you've got a hearing but then um you're not told when you don't even get a start date letter so some have been delayed for several months it that must not be allowed to be taken as uh, an exemption from the period that the appeal has been taken um 
And what I would say more widely about that <laughs> is that, that that is probably because of um, a lack of capacity doing digital events. Pins have significantly expanded it, but there, there, there is a limitation on this. And I think the idea that we should get back to real events when it's safe to do so shouldn't be just put off to September uh, because these problems are just going to grow. I think uh, roads back to a normal type of inquiry approach need to be looked at. Uh, the kids will be back in school in March, hopefully. Um, this is a capacity problem. It's not necessarily down to pins. Uh, I'm sure more resources from the government would be better, but the delays on hearings at the moment are quite, quite inappropriate. Thanks, Chris. Um, now, um, that's it for us. Um, we, uh, we're we going to take a two-week break now because it's going to be half term. And um, are we allowed to say what's happening when we come back? I can't remember whether we agreed or we can. So it's going to be George. Um, George Clark is going to join us um, the first um, day when we get back. And two weeks from now, my maths isn't good enough to tell you what that day will be, but it's two weeks <laughs> from today. <laughs> and, um, and and so we're, we're really looking forward to having him, him back. We've got some other really exciting guests, including on the 18th of May, March, um, we have got um, the Minister of Planning, um, Chris Princher, MP, which is going to be really interesting. And Char Charlie, I'm really sorry, but you're wrong. Have I got that wrong? <laughs> you have. <laughs> we come back on the 25th of February and we have Fiona Howie joining us. Fiona, I hope you're listening. The week after that, we have Gorgeous George. That's it. That's it. I thought of, as I was saying it, I could work out and say it wrong. Mary, 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 you, know, Mary, you need to be a bit more forgiving. He has been suffocating for the past hour in that T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> wearing male spanks, apparently, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> That's very uncomfortable. Pay that later, White. Um, uh, yeah, I would say 18th of March, which I have got right, I believe, is, is that's Chris Pincher. And we're going to think about how to do that, because obviously it's really it's really important um, episode. I, I quite liked him to hear a few of our case updates. I think that might be used, interesting, but we, I'd love to get some questions from the audience as well, maybe in advance, maybe have a slightly longer show. Any ideas you've got, you know how to get hold of us uh, on, via the LinkedIn page or our email or directly. Um, we'll see you in two weeks' time um, and um, have a lovely half term, if that's your thing. Um, doing nothing because that's what not allowed to do <laughs> apart from walking around in the cold and staying at home uh, take care stay well and see you in a couple of weeks time thank you way again thank you way thank you for inviting me thank you bye thank you bye